almost uh, seven years ago now, uh, I started this most incredible journey called Amazon.com. Actually, at that time, it wasn't even called Amazon.com. It was called Cadabra Inc., as in Abracadabra. That was the original name of the company. And I had phoned uh, a lawyer on the way to Seattle from a cell phone. And uh, he said, well, what do you, to incorporate the company? He said, what do you want the company to be called? And I said, Cadabra. And he said, Cadaver? And I knew that was a bad name. Um, we changed it a few months later. Web usage, worldwide web usage, was growing at something like 2,300% a year. And that was sort of a wake-up call for me that there was something going on. And um, you know, many people at that point hadn't heard of the web. They didn't have internet access. This was the time of you know, 28 uh, uh, kilo, kilobit per second modems and dial-up access and so on and so on. So it was a very different age. Um, but uh, there was clear, it was clear that there was going to be something there. And you, I, I realized you could make a bookstore on the web that could hold more books than a physical bookstore could ever hold. It could truly have universal selection. And of course, you know, since then, we've uh, expanded that into other categories, and we keep pursuing that notion of Earth's biggest selection at Amazon. Well, my background was in computers, and, uh, but books were the first best product to sell online. As a happy coincidence, I've always been a big reader, but that wasn't the reason that we chose books. My real, my real passion was computers, and that's how I was involved in this world of the web back in 94. But books was a great first best product to sell online because books were very unique and still are in one respect. And that is that there are more items in the book category than there are items in any other category. There are millions of books active and in print around the world. And the largest superstores, the largest physical book superstores only carry about 100 to 150,000 of those millions of different books. So on the web, you could build something that, tr that solved a real problem, that people can't find some of these books that they want to find. They're very good books, but they may be very narrow, uh, have a very narrow audience. And so uh, we basically built Amazon to make it possible for people to find those hard to find books. It's like low prices. We know customers like big selection, and we know that customers like fast delivery. And those things are gonna be true 10 years from now. They're gonna be true 20 years from now. So we can count on those things and we can put energy into them. We know customers like their products fast. And so we work on things that we know customers like. What has worked at Amazon is focusing on the customer, being very, putting the customer first, which is easy to say, but difficult to do. If you really are customer centric, it's like being the host of a party. You're holding the party for your guests. Uh, sometimes the host of the party is holding the party for the host of the party. <laughs> and that's, that leads to a different kind of party. It's very important to pursue your passions. And if you're doing that, the risks are often not as great as they seem to be. So for me, when I thought about uh, you know, leaving my job and starting this company, I knew there was a good chance that it wouldn't work. But I also knew that when I was 80 years old and thinking back over my life, I would never regret having tried and failed. But I might regret having never tried. And when I thought about it that way, it didn't actually seem like that big of a risk. What we have always wanted to do is raise the standard for what it means to be customer-centric to such a degree that other organizations, whether they be other companies or whether they be hospitals or government agencies, whatever the organization is, they should look at Amazon as a role model and say, how can we be as customer-centric as Amazon. Even if competitors, could, I imagine, right? Uh, yeah, I, hopefully competitors as well. But if we could make, you know, uh, uh, if, if that could be our legacy, that we kind of raise the general idea of what it means to be customer-centric, that would be a huge accomplishment. It would be accomplishing a mission that's much bigger than ourselves. Very rare idea that can be done by a single individual. Almost everything that is going to uh, change the world, solve a problem, improve something. These are usually big efforts and they require uh, you know, teams, a team working together to really get something important done. And that has been the story of Amazon.com. At every step along the way, we've had a team here uh, that is, uh, is making this work. I mean, it, it, I don't know, even, even at the smallest scale, you have to figure out how to get help from your friends, from your family members, uh, from uh, people that you can hire in those early days. I think without that, it would never work. 
what we're really focused on is thinking long term, putting the customer at the center of our universe, and inventing. Those are the three big ideas to think long term because a lot of invention doesn't work. Uh, if you're going to invent, it means you're going to experiment, you have to think long term. So these three ideas, customer centricity, long term thinking, and a passion for invention, those go together. That's how we do it. And um, by the way, we have a lot of fun doing it that way. You have been known to be somebody who would, is going to plant seeds and just wait. How do you deal with the pressure of, say, Wall Street, or you have a dot-com crash? You, I've never seen you panic. I've sort of, you stay the course and you sort of stick to your script. How do you do that? And how do you advise us to, to, to sort of internalize that as well as a strategy? Well, um, I think that uh, if you're straightforward and clear, about the way that you're going to operate, uh, then you can operate in whatever, in whatever way you choose. And, and we don't even take a position on whether our way is the right way. We just claim it's our way. Uh, but you know, Warren Buffett has a great uh, saying uh, along these lines. He says, you can hold a ballet, and that can be successful. And you can hold a rock concert, and that can be successful. Just don't hold a ballet and advertise it as a rock concert. You need to be clear. Uh, with all of your uh, stakeholders with, you know, are you holding a ballet or are you holding a rock concert? And then people get to self-select in. I think, um, and I, don't, I don't think there's a particular recipe, but there are elements of what we do uh, that I think help. So one of them is that inside our culture, we understand that even though we have some big businesses, new businesses start out small. And so, you know, it, we, we, it would be very easy for, say, the person who runs uh, our U.S. books category to say, why are we doing these experiments with things? I mean, you know, th that generated, you know, a tiny bit of revenue last year. Um, uh, why don't we instead focus those resources and that, uh, you know, that, all that brain power on this, on the books category, where we, which is a big business for us. And... Uh, instead, that, that would be a natural thing to have happen, but instead inside Amazon, you know, when a new business, you know, reaches some small milestone of sales, uh, email messages go around and everybody's, you know, giving virtual high fives for reaching that milestone. And I think it's because we know from our past experiences that big things start small. Uh, you know, it, 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 the biggest oak starts from an acorn and you've got to recognize, if you want to do anything new, You've got to be willing to let that acorn grow into a little sapling and then finally into a small tree. And maybe one day it'll be a big business on its own. You've done so well at Amazon is you've undercut all of your rivals by keeping the prices low. Does that same strategy apply to tablets? Yes, our approach is premium products at non-premium prices. So we sell the hardware at break even. So we don't try to make any money when we sell this hardware. And we hope to make money when people use the devices, not when they buy the devices. And so that's a very different approach from uh, most companies. Most companies are building quite a bit of profit into the sale of these devices. Greta team ferocity. What does that mean to you? Well, it, it means step-by-step uh, step ferociously. And it's the motto for Blue Origin. Um, and uh, uh, basically, you can't skip steps. You have to put one foot in front of the other. Things take time. Uh, you, there are no shortcuts. And, uh, but, uh, but you want to do those steps with you know, passion and ferocity. Whatever it is that you want to do, you're, there's going to be risk in your life. And risk is a necessary component of progress. You can make any pioneering movements in the world of any kind, whether they be the geographical, physical exploration that I've just been talking about, or whether it be, uh, you know, a more cerebral exploration of a scientific field, or I bet you could ask that question of every speaker here, and I bet that every speaker here has taken substantial risks, uh, whether it be intellectual or otherwise, to achieve what they're, you know, what they've done. I think, um, to some degree, uh, you follow your passions and then wait, the, you know, you have to hope the wave catches you. I was always interested in computers. Um, I was always interested in software. Uh, I was always a big reader. And so 
it wasn't, you know, which made me alert to things like the internet um, and the possibility that you could build a bookstore online that would have universal selection. I think everybody has their own uh, passion, their own thing that they're interested in, and then you're very alert to the things that that are in the sphere of influence of that passion. So your passion has led you to change the world, frankly, with Amazon. But yet, you've got Blue Origin, you've got Bezos Explorations. Why can't somebody like you just rest on your laurels? Go play golf. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I love what I do. I have, um, I also have four kids. I have a wife that I love. I have a lot of passions and interests. Um, but I, one of them is, you know, at Amazon, the rate of change is so high, and I love that. I love the, I love the pace of change. Um, I love the fact that I get to work with these smart, big, smart teams. Uh, the people I work with are so smart, and they all they're self-selected for loving to invent on behalf of customers. And so, you know, it's not. Uh, I, do I love every moment of every? day no that's why they call it work there's you know there's always there are things that i that i don't enjoy but if i'm really objective about it and i look at it i'm so lucky to be working uh, alongside all these passionate people and i love it why would i why would i go sit on a beach you have to back up and find the right time horizon for what you're trying to do but you know at amazon we probably do most of our things, we expect the, to get some results in sort of five, six, seven, eight years. But we find a lot of our, uh, you know, other companies that compete against us in various ways, they're often trying to get things done in, you know, two or three years. And so we can do things that, you know, if, you, if, you, if everything has to work in two to three years, then that limits what you can do. If you give yourself the, the breathing room to say, okay, I'll, I, I'm okay if it takes seven years, all of a sudden you have way more opportunities. Brands for companies are like reputations for people. And reputations are hard earned and easily lost. So the most important intellectual property that a company can have is for us, it's, that, it's, it's, it's Amazon. It's the, that name, but what it stands for. And we've worked very hard to earn trust. You can't ask for trust. You just have to do it the hard way, one step at a time. You, you make a promise and then fulfill the promise. You say, we'll deliver this to you, uh, you know, tomorrow, and then you actually deliver it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do that over and over again, then it ultimately you can instill your company's name with a reputation. And that's, I think, you know, sometimes people talk about brands in this very amorphous way, but for me, I, I like to think of it as a person, and what is the reputation that that person has, and how have they earned that reputation? I always uh, wanted to please. You know, it was one of the things, and I think one of the things that these teachers who are really, really good do is they recognize that the, their students, they sort of, they, get, they, they create that environment where you can be very, satisfied by what's by the process of learning that's going on so it's just, it's like anything if you do something and you find it to be a very satisfying experience then you want to do more of it and so the great teachers somehow convey in their very attitude and their words and their actions and everything they do that this is an important thing you're learning and and by doing that you end up wanting to do more of it and more of it and more of it and I you know I think that's a, a real talent uh, that some people have to kind of convey the importance of that and to reflect it back to the student. It's not easy to make things different. I mean, it's not difficult. It's not hard to make things different, but it is hard to make things different and better. Most of the solutions, most of the problems in the world already have solutions of one kind or another. The, all of those solutions can be improved upon. Uh, there's no chance that um, anything is perfected yet. I don't believe that. <laughs> but those, all those solutions are highly evolved and they've been, you know, people have been working on solutions to most problems for a long time. But still, I, you, know, you know, somebody, it wasn't that long ago, somebody figured out that you should add wheels to suitcases. Pretty good improvement. <laughs>
When we were Amazon.toast, we only had a hundred and, right. when we were declared Amazon.toast, I think we had 150 employees. Barnes & Noble had 30,000 employees. And somebody wrote an article that said, you know, Amazon has had a great two year run, but now the big boys have shown up and they're gonna steamroll them. And, you know, we had a all hands meeting. I called all 150 employees together. I said, look, because everybody's worried about it. They just, every employee has read the Amazon.toast article. Every mother of every employee has read the Amazon.toast article and <laughs> has father, called and said, Your father and mother who live here you, in New York. Yeah, are you okay? Yeah. And so we had an all hands meeting and I said, look, um, you should wake up worried, terrified every morning, but don't be worried about our competitors because they're never going to send us any money anyway. Let's be worried about our customers and stay heads down focused. It's hard work, so it's, it's easy to have ideas. It's very hard to turn an idea into a successful product. There are a lot of steps in between and it takes persistence, relentlessness. So I always tell people who are, you know, who think they want to be entrepreneurs, it's, you need a combination of stubborn relentlessness and flexibility. And you have to know when to be which. And basically you need to be stubborn on your vision because otherwise it'll be too easy to give up. But you need to be very flexible on the details because as you go along pursuing your vision, you'll find that some of your preconceptions were wrong and you're gonna need to be able to change those things. So I think uh, taking an idea successfully all the way to the market and turning it into a real product that people care about and that really improves people's lives is a lot of hard work. It often doesn't make sense for us to think of it as a pitched mm -hmm. battle. You know, sometimes um, people think about business as it's kind of like a, a, a sporting event. There's a winner and a loser. It's not a zero-sum game. It usually isn't. Uh, I, I'm sure there are cases where, but most often, industries succeed. So I can tell you, I think e-commerce is succeeding. And the way we think about it, nobody else has to fail for us to do well. I think e-books is like that. I think there are gonna be many winners. I think e-books is gonna be a huge industry. I think it's always hard to know why you're drawn to a particular thing. I think part of it is if you have a facility with that thing, then of course it's satisfying to do it. And, and so in a way that's self-reinforcing. Um, and, 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 and certainly I always had a facility with computers. I always got along well with them. And, um, and it was, you know, it was, they're such extraordinary tools. I mean, you can, you can teach them to do things and then, they, they, and then they actually do them. I mean, it's a kind of a, 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 an incredible tool that we've built here in the 20th century. Um, and that was a, uh, a love affair that really did start in fourth grade. Um, and then when I, by the time I got to high school, um, I think when I was in 11th grade, I got an Apple II Plus and, uh, and you know, continued fooling around with computers. And then by the time I got to Princeton, I was um, you know, taking all the computer classes and actually not just learning how to hack, but learning about algorithms and, and you know, some of the mathematics behind computer science. And it's fascinating. I mean, it's really a very involving and fun subject. Our focus is going to be, you know what, we'll try to pay attention to those competitors, but we're not going to obsess over them. We're going to obsess over readers, and that because those are the people who are buying that device. And we're going to make it. And it's not just a business for us. It's a mission for us. And missionaries build better products. You cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. To, to, to invent, you need to experiment. And if, it's, if you know in advance that it's going to work, it is not an experiment. And so that's a very important thing. You, you know, it's a, the, they are inseparable twins, failure and invention. And so you have to be willing to do that. And it's embarrassing to fail. Um, it, you know, it's always embarrassing to fail. But you have to say, no, that's not how this works. If I said to you, you have a 10% chance of a, of, with a particular decision, a 10% chance of a 100x return. You should take that bet every time, but you're still gonna be wrong nine out of 10 times, and it's gonna feel bad nine out of 10 times. And in, 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 with technology, the outcomes, the results can be very long-tailed. The, the payoff is, can be very asymmetric, which is why you should do so much experimentation. 
you know, everybody knows that if you swing for the fences, you hit more home runs, but you also strike out more. But with the baseball, that analogy doesn't go far enough because with baseball, no matter how well you connect with the ball, you can only get four runs. The success is capped at four runs. But in business, every once in a while, you step up to the plate and you hit the ball so hard, you get a thousand runs. And so when, that, when you have that kind of asymmetric payoff and you know, one, at, one at back can get you a thousand runs, it encourages you to experiment more. It's the right business decision to experiment more. It's also better for your customers. Customers like um, the successful experiments. You are 23 years old is that you don't already know everything. <laughs> it turns out, I mean, uh, as I suspect, uh, uh, you know, people learn more and more as they get older that you seem to learn, you seem to realize that you know less and less every year that goes by. I can only imagine that by the time I'm you know, 70, I will realize I know nothing. <laughs> Thing for companies is you need to be um, if you, nimble and robust. So you need to be able to take a punch, uh, and you also need to be quick and, 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 and innovative and, and doing new things at a high speed. That's, that's the best defense against the future. And you have to always be leaning into the future. If you're if you're leaning away from the future, the future is going to win every time. Never, ever, ever lean away from the future. You know, at this point in time, uh, we haven't built a lasting company yet. We still have a tremendous amount of hard work ahead of us. Um, but we have all the assets in place now. We have eliminated uh, the necessity for the luck that a startup company requires. And now, uh, you know, our future is in our own hands as a team and as a company. We have so many smart people. We have so many customers who treat us so well. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and we have the right kind of culture that obsesses over the customer. If there's one reason we have done better than most of our peers uh, in the Internet space, you know, over the last six years, it is because we have focused like a laser on customer experience. And that really does matter. Uh, I, I think in any business, it certainly matters online where word of mouth is so very, very powerful. You know, if you make a customer unhappy, they won't tell five friends, they'll tell 5,000 friends. So we are at a point now where we have all of the things we need to build an important and lasting company. And if we don't, it will be shame on us. We all have adversity in our lives. You, you, I, 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 would, I, would, I doubt if you really... You know, if you know somebody, any friend or anybody that you talk to, um, uh, there's no lack of adversity. And the uh, and by the way, that's good because it's what teaches us how to get back up. You fall down, you get back up. It always happens. And uh, you know, you get certain um, gifts in life, and you want to take advantage of those. Um, uh, but you. I guess my advice on adversity and uh, success would be to be proud not of your gifts, but of your hard work and your choices. So, you know, you may be, the kinds of gifts you get in life, you know, you might be really good at math. It might be really easy for you. That's a kind of gift. Um, but practicing that math and taking it to the next step, that could be very challenging and hard um, and take a lot of sweat. That's a choice. You can't really be proud of your gifts because they were given to you. Um, you can be grateful for them and thankful for them. Um, and, but your choices, you choose to work hard. Um, you choose to do hard things. Those are choices that you can be proud of. You can be, uh, I think one of the things that's very important to note about stress is that stress primarily comes from not taking action over something that you can have some control over. So if I find that some particular thing is causing me to have stress, that's a, uh, a, a warning flag for me. What it means is there's something that I haven't completely identified, perhaps in my conscious mind, that is bothering me and I haven't yet taken any action on it. I find as soon as I identify it and make the first phone call or send off the first email message or whatever it is that we're going to do to start to address that situation, even if it's not solved, the mere fact that we're addressing it 
dramatically reduces any stress that might come from it. So stress comes from ignoring things that you shouldn't be ignoring, um, I think in large part. So uh, stress doesn't come, people get stress uh, uh, wrong all the time, in my opinion. Stress doesn't come from hard work, for example. You know, you can be working incredibly hard and loving it. And likewise, you can be out of work and incredibly stressed over that. So, and likewise, if you kind of use the, you know, use that as an analogy for what I was just talking about, if you're out of work, but you're going through, you know, a disciplined uh, approach of, you know, a series of job interviews and so on and working to remedy that situation, you're going to be a lot less stressed than if you're just worrying about it and doing nothing. Be an inventor of any kind, inventing a new, you know, a new service offering for customers or a new product or anything. The, being an inventor, requires, because the world is so complicated, you have to be a domain expert. I mean, in a way, even if, even if you're not at the beginning, you have to learn, 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 learn enough so that you become a domain expert. But the danger is once you become a domain expert, you can be trapped by that knowledge. And so inventors have this paradoxical ability to have that, you know, 10,000 hours of practice and be a real domain expert and have that beginner's mind, have that that look at it freshly, even though they know so much about the domain. And that's the key um, to, to inventing. You, you have to have both. And I think that is intentional. I think all of us have that inside of us, and we can all do it, but you have to be intentional about it. You have to say, yeah, I am going to become an expert, and I'm going to keep my beginner's mind. One of the things that I think people would be surprised to learn, and I don't know if this is true for everybody, but I, I suspect it is. Um, and I think that at least uh, at a certain age, the basic foundational things about people are largely set. And so, you know, I'm a lottery winner of a certain kind. And I suspect if you were to go, you know, survey lottery winners, you would find that the core things about them don't really change because they won the lottery. Um, and I, I, think, I think that's probably, and I think people are always very curious about that. How does it foundationally, fundamentally change a person when they win a lottery? And I don't think it does very much. Did I kind of anticipate what would happen over the last 22 years at Amazon? And the answer is God, no. So, you know, Amazon started as a very small company. Um, it was me and a few other people. I was driving all the packages to the post office myself in my 1987 Chevy Blazer. Um, and uh, th when I raised money for Amazon, I had to raise a million dollars, which I raised from 22 different investors, $50,000 each. They got 20% of the company for, uh, uh, for the million dollars. And um, uh, it was a, 40 people told me no. So I had to take 60 meetings to get 20 yeses. The first question was always, what's the internet? And I had to walk through that. And this was 1994, early 95. And so did I anticipate, you know, fast forward to today and, and the current version of it? No. It has been one foot in front of the other. And I think that that is true for most businesses. Um, where you kind of proceed adaptively, it's step by step, you, you figure it out, you have a success, and then you kind of double down on that success and you figure out what, what else you can do, what customers want. I find very motivating, and, it's and I think this is probably a very common form of motivation or, or motive for or cause of motivation, is I love people counting on me. And so, you know, it, today, it's so easy to be motivated because we have millions of customers counting on us at Amazon.com. We've got thousands of investors counting on us. And uh, we've got, you know, we're a team of thousands of employees all counting on each other. And so it's, uh, and that's fun. Since I was five years old, that's when Neil Armstrong stepped onto the surface of the moon. I've been um, kind of passionate about space, rockets, rocket engines, space travel. I became a science fiction reader. Um, and I've always known that I wanted to uh, um, you know, 
do something having to do with space, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it for really almost my whole life. And that's one of the things, you guys will find that you have passions, and having a passion is a gift. I think we all have passions, and you don't get to uh, choose them, they pick you, but you have to be alert to them. You have to be looking for them. And when you find your passion, it's a fantastic gift for you because it gives you direction, it gives you purpose. Uh, you can have a job, or you can have a career, or you can have a calling, and the best thing is to have a calling. And if you find your passion, you'll have that, and all your work won't feel like work to you. Do something you're very passionate about. And don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. I think we actually saw this, I think you see it all over the place in many different contexts, but I think we saw it uh, in the internet world quite a bit, where you know at the sort of peak of the uh, sort of internet uh, you know, mania in, say, 1999, you found people who were, uh, you know, very passionate. Something they kind of left that job and decided, I'm going to, you know, do something in the internet because it's, you know, it was almost like the, you know, the 1849 gold rush in a way. I mean, you find that people, uh, if you go back and study the history of the 1849 gold rush, you find that, you know, uh, at that time, everybody who was in was within a shouting distance of California was, you know, they might have been a doctor, but they quit being a doctor and they started panning for gold. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that almost never works. Um, and even if it does work, uh, you know, according to some metric, financial success or whatever it might be, I suspect it leaves you ultimately unsatisfied. So you really need to be very clear with yourself. And I think one of the best ways to do that is this notion of projecting yourself forward to age 80, looking back on your life and trying to make sure you've minimized the number of regrets you have. That works for, that works for career decisions, it works for family decisions. Um, you know, do you want, I, I have a 14-month-old a son and it's very easy for me to, if I think about myself when I'm 80, I know I want to watch that little guy grow up. Um, and so it, it's, I don't want to be 80 and think, shoot, you know, I, I missed that whole thing and I don't have the kind of relationship with my son that I wished I had and so on and so on. So if you think about that, so I, I guess another thing that I would recommend to people is that they always take a long-term point of view. And I think this is something about which there's a lot of uh, controversy. You know, there's a, uh, there's a, you know, some, a lot of people, and I'm just not one of them, believe that you should live for the now. I think what you do is you think about the, 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 the great expanse of time ahead of you and try to make sure that you're planning for that in a way that's going to leave you ultimately satisfied. Um, so this is just my, this is the way it works for me. And I mean, this is, everybody needs to find that for themselves. Um, uh, so I think there are a lot of paths to satisfaction and you need to find one that works, works for you. Ask everybody to not think in two to three year time frames, but to think in five to seven year time frames. To not think about, when somebody says to me, congratulates Amazon on a good quarter, um, which is a very common thing to say. You meet somebody, they're being nice, they looked at your financial results for the quarter, they're like, good quarter. I say thank you. But what I'm thinking to myself is that quarter, all that, those quarterly results were actually pretty much fully baked about three years ago. And so like today, I'm working on, you know, uh, a quarter that is going to happen in 2020, not next quarter. Next quarter, uh, for all practical purposes, is done already, and it's probably been done for a couple of years. Um, and so if you start to think that way, um, it changes how you spend your time, how you plan, um, where you put your energy. Um, and, and your ability to look around corners gets better. So many things improve if you can take a long term. And by the way, it's not natural for humans. So it's a, it's a discipline that you have to build. The, um, the kind of, you know, uh, get rich slowly schemes are not big sellers on uh, infomercials. You know, it's, uh, and so that's something that you have to sort of steal yourself for and discipline and teach um, uh, over time. And one of the things that you, you get a chance to do uh, at some point in your life is to be a philanthropist. And um, so uh, I, you know, I didn't grow up 
hoping, you know, boy, maybe I'll be a philanthropist one day. That wasn't ever on my list of, you know, archaeologist, astronaut, um, those things I wanted to be. Physicist, I never... <laughs> I think in large part because I never expected to have the means <laughs> to be a philanthropist. But I think that if you win um, a lottery uh, of, of this kind of size, that one of the things that, that, uh, that over time you have an obligation to do is to think about the ways that that, uh, that that wealth can be used in a highly leveraged way. I also think, by the way, it's really easy to give away money in highly unleveraged ways where it's just a waste of money. And I suspect that it takes as much sort of time, energy, focus, and hard work uh, to effectively give away money as it does to get it in the first place. You can choose. We all get to choose our life stories, and um, it's the choices that define us, not our gifts. Everybody in this room has many gifts. Um, I have many gifts. You can never be proud of your gifts because they're gifts. They were given to you. You might be you know, tall, and, or you might be really good at math, or you might be extremely beautiful or handsome, or, you know, there, or, there are many gifts, and you can only be proud really of your choices because those are the things that you are that you're that you are acting on and one of the most important choices that each of us has and you know this just as well as I do is um, you can choose a life of ease and comfort or you can choose a life of service and adventure and when you're 80 which one of those things do you think you're gonna be more proud of you're gonna be more proud of having chosen a life of service and adventure. I've always been uh, uh, focused. When I was in Montessori school, um, the uh, Montessori school teacher told my mom that I wouldn't switch tasks. And, um, they, and they, they got me to switch tasks by picking me up, including my chair, and just moving me to the new task station. Um, I've gotten a little better about that uh, over the years, but it's still, task switching is still a problem for me. On the internet today, you know, two kids in their dorm room can reinvent an industry. That's how, how, uh, how it could, because you don't, you, the heavy lifting infrastructure is in place for that. Today, two kids in their dorm room can't do anything interesting in space. You know, you could build a CubeSat, there's not that much interesting about CubeSats. <laughs> and the, um, it'll, it, that may change, but right now, there's just, you, you need, there, there are certain laws of physics and certain things you need size for, and the things need to be big. We need to be able to put big things in space at low cost. And so, if I'm 80 years old and I can say to myself that Blue Origin did the heavy lifting, you know, I'm using my Amazon winnings, mm -hmm to do a new piece of heavy lifting infrastructure, um, uh, uh, which is low cost access to space. The vehicles have to be reusable. You can't throw them away. Throw away space vehicles every time, you're never gonna lower the cost. So we're trying to lower the price of admission into space so that thousands of entrepreneurs can then do amazing, surprising things. Nobody in 1995, so that much just nobody in 95 predicted travel. Snapchat. Right. You know, it's like, I can't predict for you what amazing entrepreneurs, brilliant, amazing entrepreneurs will do in space, but I know if I give them low cost access to space, some brilliant, you know, 22 year old is gonna figure it out. It's one of those things about what companies get sustainable. It's those that provide platforms upon which others can build. If you, Amazon if does you it, empower does others, it, you. empower others to do things. So AWS is like that. Kindle Direct Publishing is like that. Our third-party selling business is like that. Fulfillment by Amazon is like that. Every time you figure out some way of providing tools and services that empower other people to deploy their creativity, you're really onto something. What motivates me when times are rough? Um, you know, I find if I'm stressed about something, it's usually because I'm not doing anything about it. And so if I'm stressed about something, I'm trying to figure out why am I stressed? I'm listening to my body as a signal that, I'm, that something is uh, awry. And then I find that the stress goes away the second I take the first step 
of, you know, identify the source of the stress. Why am I stressed about this? What's going on? And then, you know, talk to somebody about it. Find, you know, find allies. Um, it, you know, I would say that uh, uh, if you can find um, friends uh, who are interested in similar things or want to help you solve a problem, problem solving is, um, is inspiring for me all by itself. I have, as long as I have allies, there's nothing more fun than getting in a room with a group of uh, inventors and saying, look, here's the problem. Let's invent a solution to it. And as soon as you start doing that, I find that it turns from uh, something that might create stress into something that creates fun.